Venice was one of the most important cities in Europe during the late Middle Ages and the modern era. In this period when the city was the seat of an independent state which controlled trade in the Mediterranean and throughout the East, it was known by the name the Queen of the Adriatic. The special place which Venice still holds today in the common imagination is based largely on this golden age as does the tendency of many scholars to attribute the city with an innate and unique vocation for political autonomy and trade. In truth, owing to the limited number of sources, as far as its origins is concerned, we are rather uh, in the dark as to how and when the city grew from a small fishing village on the lagoon to a superpower ruled by a doge and with a seaport running long distance shipping. <coughs> My talk uh, will focus on this development, a process uh, which uh, was far from linear, with the aim of introducing the major issues um, around which scholarly debate revolves, so that in 15 minutes, more or less, you can dismiss some common places and get a general idea of what we currently know and above all we do not know about Venice in the early Middle Ages. Um, it was only in the 13th century that the archipelago of Rialto took the name of Venice. Instead, during the early medieval period, the place name often declined the plural form was used to indicate this scattered group of settlements exist along the coast between Grado and Cavarzare. In a very famous passage of the history of the Lombards, Paul de Dicken writes that in his own time, namely at the end of the 18th century, the 8th century, the ancient region of Venezia, which before the Lombard conquest of Italy formed a vast area stretching from Pannonia to the river Adda had been reduced to a few islands. The deacon does not talk about a mass migration of people, which actually never took place. Instead, he describes the withdrawal of Byzantine military control over the northeastern part of the peninsula, which throughout the 7th century was restricted to a handful of strongholds on, along the coast. <coughs> Archaeological excavation showed that even the area where Venice would later uh, grow was inhabited on almost a permanent, permanent basis in this period. At present, two stratigraphic sequences have been published. The first shows um, a rectangular wooden house with a fireplace um, and the second shows a waterfront with a, maybe a um, wooden path and a large building with brick foundation recently interpreted as a public area, maybe a frontier post. In any case, originally the lagoon settlements uh, must have been quite modest, as is indirectly confirmed by the Frankish annals. In the context of the struggle between the Western and the Eastern empires for the control of the Upper Adriatic, the analyst narrates how Charlemagne received the representatives of the Byzantine provinces of Venezia and Dalmatia in 809. We are talking of the Venetian dukes Obelario and Beatus, and the duke and the bishop of Zada, Paulus and Donatus. The different ways in which the writer refers to Obelarium Beatus on one hand and to Paulus and Donatus on the other is rather revealing. Indeed, it implies that while Dalmatia possessed a major urban center within its territory, namely Zada, the lagoon area, on the contrary, did not, even if it must be added not yet for long. The development of Venice 
as a town begins only a few years later, when sometime between 812 and 819, the Duke Agnello Particiaco founded the public palace, and shortly after his son and successor Giovanni started building the annexed chapel of St. Mark. It is from this moment onwards that, politically and economically speaking, the growth of Venice initiates, even if the exact times and modalities have not yet been completely clarified. The present-day Ducal Palace looks like as it did in the late 16th century. Over the years, however, it has been repeatedly destroyed and rebuilt. Conversely, the place where Agnello Particiaco originally erected it has remained unchanged. And since then, the palace has been the setting of the most dramatic events in the history of Venice, such as, just to quote only the most famous, the assassination of Pietro Candiano. Above all, the palace was where the Duke, surrounded by the public assembly, issued a number of important uh, government acts. The Venetian assembly was called Placitum in Latin, in Latin. Preceded over by the duke in charge, it included the Patriarch of Grado, his bishops and abbots, the aristocracy, called the primates, and all the people of Venice. Traditional historiography has often exaggerated the importance of the Venetian Placitum. First, it has been taken for granted that it existed before the 19th century, even if the earliest documentary evidence dates back to the year 900 AD. Secondly, great, uh, great emphasis has been put on the participation in it of the Venetian people, namely all the free men in the duchy, or as would seem more probable, its most outstanding representatives. In the light of subsequent institutional outcomes, it was assumed that the Venetians had already been able to influence the Duke's power in these early times, as well as during the period of Italian city-states, we are in the mid-12th century, when split into two councils, the Venetians flanked the Doge in the government of the city. In reality, the way in which the public assembly worked in its social composition in the early medieval period are substantially mysterious. What we know, indeed, is that during the 9th and 10th centuries, local communities of various kinds were able to act as social and political collective bodies in other areas of the peninsula. These were especially the inhabitants of the cities of the Po Valley, called with the Latin Chives, citizens. In, um, in 904, for instance, King Berengar gave the Bishop of Cremona and his Conchives, fellow citizens, permission to rebuild the city walls where they deemed more appropriate. We can assume that this decision was taken at a meeting, and yet, as with the Venetian Placento, we don't know who took actually part in it, or how things were carried out. Besides citizens, even the population of, of more modest centers, such as villages and castles, seem in this very period to have been capable of organizing themselves collectively, especially in the case of legal disputes. In 859 AD, for instance, the so-called consortes of Comacchio, in other words, people with common interests, represented by a certain Constantino Dativus, um, to say a law expert, claim ownership over half of a landed estate against the Church of Ravenna. The, exam the example of Comacchio is not accidental. In a way similar to Venice, in fact, this town shows a market-oriented, how we have seen, uh, a market-oriented vocation very early on. <coughs> this allows me to introduce the second key aspect of the history of Venice, that is its economic dynamism. Between mm, 750 and 850, several written sources record the presence of Venetian merchants and ships in the eastern Mediterranean and the Po Valley. This is a well-known documentary dossier, which without doubt underlines the mercantile character of the settlement. 
However, the real value of the national trade in this period is still strongly debated. New data, most circumstantial, recently collected by Michael McCormick, seem to point to an early socio-economic expansion of the town dating back to the end of the 8th century. By contrast, the distribution of the Venetian archival documents across time suggests that the turning point in Venetian growth was, in terms of its population size and accumulation of wealth, from the mid 11th century onwards. Thus, in the end, a coherent picture of the period of the economic rise of Venice has yet to be fully drawn. Indeed, so far, not even archaeology has made a decisive contribution. As already mentioned, we have two urban excavation, we have uncovered a wooden house and what was probably a public building. The four, the only economic <coughs> markers are the monetary fines of Arab Byzantine coins, which, I mean, although testifying to the city's international contacts, uh, are still very modest both in quantity and quality. However, if it if we do extend our vision from the group of islands of Rialto to the entire strip of coasts, going from Grado to Ravenna, the archaeological data is of, is of <coughs> much greater interest. Obviously, in this case, the most tricky comparison we can make is with Comacchio, where the excavation of a productive area for working metals and glass and of extensive port infrastructures has enabled archaeology to identify the site as a real emporium, as important as those in the Northern Europe. In addition, the study of early medieval imported pottery, such as Globora Amphora from the Aegean Sea or the Black Sea, shows how in the 8th century the entire Upper Adriatic <coughs> area, including the Venetian Lagoon, was well positioned <coughs> inside an interregional network of, of exchanges. Thus, if in the context outlined outlined by archaeology, seems to reflect an economically active role of the city. At the same time, this poses new and more interesting challenges. Bearing in mind that other lively centers of trade did exist along with the Lagoon settlement, we should ask ourselves why, in a long-term perspective, Venice enjoyed a longer-lasting <coughs> success and what made the difference in its uh, case. As is common knowledge compared to its strong Roman heritage, Italy has only a few examples of new settlements, namely those set up and developed during the early medieval period, and Venice was uh, is definitely one of, uh, of these. In the light of the objects that the organizer of this workshop have, uh, have set, that is to enrich our understanding of early medieval urbanism as a wholly dynamic process, the Venetian case turns out to be interesting in many respects. In fact, the written sources and archaeological data available paint a contradictory picture of the rise and growth of the city and show how, prior to 1000 AD, the outcome of its development was uncertain and unpredictable. Moreover, in a comparative perspective, the alleged uniqueness of its history is on one hand reviewed, but on the other actually confirmed. For this very reason, the lesson that Venice imparts its pressures. We must avoid all simplistic, simplistic explanation which nurture myths and legends. And these are all very inspiring, but they are not the type of narrative which pertains to historians and archaeologists. From our point of view, complexity is the key to a different story, probably less triumphant, but in my opinion, equally fascinating. Thank you very much.